considering this dry disposal method again in some parts of the world because water is short and it's a sad fact that 90% of the water we use is bacteriologically pure water and it's used to flush toilets. So some people think this was something we ought to look at again. Well, one of the diseases which is spread by water is cholera. And in uh, 1854, there was a very serious outbreak in London. And a London physician, Dr. John Snow, incidentally, he made all sorts of discoveries and, and contributions to medicine. He noticed that the disease spread out, uh, and he, he came to the conclusion that it was somehow linked to the water supply of a pump in Broad Street. He plotted the, the incident of, the, of these uh, diseases and reckoned it was centered on this pump. Now, bear in mind, he didn't know anything about the disease-causing organism of cholera, a, a thing called the Vibrio, but he uh, worked out that this was a problem. So what did he do? Well, this is the pump. This has now been erected as a memorial to him in London and Broad Street. You notice there's something odd about this pump. It doesn't have a handle. And the reason is, of course, the first thing that Dr. Snow did was take the handle off. Well, of course, the local residents were annoyed because they couldn't use the pump, and it forced them to go elsewhere for their water supply, and the other wells and pumps were clear. And so it's simply by taking the handle, no water could be obtained. Uh, and, and so in this way, uh, he was able to uh, prevent the spread of the disease. He was right, and we now understand uh, why uh, this succeeded in stopping the spread of the disease. And from then onwards, Attempts were made to separate the disposal of human waste from the water supply. It had happened in this case that uh, something had gone wrong and, and the water was being contaminated. Well, by removing that, he forced them to go elsewhere and the disease uh, was contained. And now we know, of course, how important this is. And if you notice, often when there's a, a, a civil war and there are refugee camps, one of the first things that tends to happen is the cholera outbreak. This is one of the big problems when you get large numbers of people without a, a, an adequate clean water supply and without proper means of sanitation. Well, we need to move on. What about diet? Well, the Jews, of course, have well-known dietary regulations. Uh, they don't uh, eat pig meat and pig meat products. And now we understand the um, medical basis of this. Uh, and these pro provisions are designed to stop food poisoning. And so this is the law. Do not eat any detestable thing. It lists what you can eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, and so on. You can eat any animal with a split roof, a split roof divided in two, that chews the cud. So that's a very simple rule. You, you look, and if the animal chews the cud, and it has a cloven or split roof, then it's safe. But of course, there, there were those who, the animals that for which this was not allowed. And, and the law listed them. There were things like um, uh, the um, rabbit and the, and the camel and so on. Often they chewed the cud, but they didn't have a split hoof. And the pig was unclean because although the hoof is split, it doesn't chew the cud. Very simple rule. And the reason is, of course, that pig meat and pig meat products are notorious for causing outbreaks of food poisoning. Salmonella. Uh, in chicken was, was, is now a, a common problem. But before that, if you talk to environmental health officers, they tell you that nearly every case of food poisoning could be traced back to uh, pork, pork pies, pork sausage, and so on. Because, of course, it was even worse in those days. They didn't even have refrigeration to try and prevent this. And we have an, a really old cookbook at home which tells you that you uh, mustn't eat pork when there isn't an R in the month. So between May and August, of course, you go through those months, uh, uh, May to August, they don't have an R in the month, and they say keep clear, because of course, uh, in, in, in uh, Victorian times, no refrigerators, and so there was a danger of um, getting food poisoning. But there are other reasons why pigs are a problem. Influenza, for example, is a disease that we think we've caught from pigs. But uh, swine vesicular disease is a disease that pigs have caught from us. You see, when people live in close association with animals, there's a ch chance that these the viruses can go from one to the other and then uh, they change and you get virulent strains. And of course, things like Asian flu, we talk about Asian flu because very often it starts in the Far East where people live in close proximity with their, their pigs. And of course, poultry also are often in the home running about 
and that's why bird flu was considered to be a problem a little while ago. We're very close to pigs. It's, it, it's, um, it's almost humbling in a way. Biologically and physiologically, pigs are very much like us and we're like them. Insulin for diabetics was until recently extracted from the pancreas of pigs, but now we uh, have genetically modified bacteria and we can culture it in that way. And pigs are very important in medical research. Um, a lot of work is done in, in, in uh, medical research using the pig as the test, as a substitute for ourselves. I have a friend who's a company who makes surgical dressings and they develop these and test them on pigs. See, pigs are like us. They have some hair, but not very much, and their skin is like ours. And many of the organs of, of, of pigs are, are like ours, and so when surgeons want to develop a new technique, they can use pigs to uh, test their the, the technique and see if it works. The trouble is, th their limbs are wrong. Pigs have relatively short legs from, 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 from us, so they bred a pig with long legs, and it's called a medical pig. It looks like an ordinary pig almost walking on stilts, and that allows orthopedic surgeons to test new techniques, replacing hips and knees and so on. And finally, they're working on a transgenic pig, and that's a pig with human genes built into it, and they're hoping that that will be a suitable means of getting organs for transplant that won't be rejected. But it hasn't been done yet because we don't know whether there's something a pig carries that doesn't affect the pig, say a virus, but if the organ is transplanted into human beings, it might then cause a disease for which we have no treatment. Well, we press on. Uh, the other uh, test was whether, in fact, anything in the water had fins and scales. And fish and shellfish, of course, uh, are, are another potential source of, of food poisoning, but it mostly comes from shellfish and not from the fish. If it has fins and scales, then it's almost uh, re reasonable to assume it would be quite safe to eat. There may be a few exceptions. By and large, it's safe. And the reason shellfish, of course, are uh, not uh, safe in many ways is because their filter feeders, oysters and mussels and cockles and clams, filter seawater. And the best place to live if you're one of those is just right off the end of a sewage outfall. Because food is raining down on you all the time, and they concentrate this in their, in their bodies. And then if you pick them and, 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 and don't cook them properly and, and don't make sure they're clean, then you're just collecting pathogenic bacteria affect you. So in Britain the rule is that all these um, shellfish when they're harvested they have to go into uh, tanks of, uh, with seawater. This is flowing and changed and the, the idea is that they get all this stuff out of their guts uh, and then uh, they're safe to eat providing you cook them properly. The problem is that oysters are nearly always eaten live, so they tell me. So beware. And things like crustacea, crabs, lobsters and so on are scavengers and they're also potentially risky. So, you know, the, the laws are there. Very easy to decide what's safe to eat. If it's got scales and fins, it's almost um, certainly safe. Jews don't eat eels, by the way, certain eels, because they have scales, but they're very small. They can't see them with the naked eye, so they don't eat eels. So, you know, it's, it's a very simple rule, isn't it? It's got fins and scales, it's safe. And, of course, in the case of shellfish, they don't have fins, so they don't have scales. And so they are dangerous. There are other things that uh, are in the law poses. One of the interesting ones is the prohibition of fat and blood in the diet. Now, the law says here don't eat any fat of these animals that are safe to eat. You can eat the meat, but keep off the fat. Now, some of us might have difficulty spelling cholesterol, but at least we know what it is. And of course, a lot of doctors say we're eating far too much fatty food today. We're, we're, we're taking uh, particularly saturates. And a high fat diet has been linked to certain uh, bowel disorders, uh, particularly colon cancer, and of course, uh, clogging up of arteries and heart disease. Now it's interesting, the Jews used to cook with olive oil, which is low in saturates. They ate wholemeal bread. In fact, their whole diet, you know, fruits such as grapes and dates and figs and pomegranates, would contribute to a healthy diet. And a little while ago in Britain, there, there was a sort of uh, craze and interest in what was called the Mediterranean diet, which was reckoned to be very safe and good for, for your health. Uh, and so the eating of, of fat here is prohibited, uh, and it must, it was, for all time, they must not eat fat or blood. 